Hello again, everybody. This is Dr. Bob Zyback. Uh, we are back at the Elliott State Forest. Thanks to the wonder of Zoom, I'm on the road on the way up to Cougar Pass uh, Lookout. Uh, today's lab, this is our second lab. Uh, the first lab focused on history. Uh, the second lab is in uh, six parts. The first part will be me uh, reviewing the work done by previous year's students. The very first uh, Elliott State Forest Recreation Plan, the uh, review and rewriting and uh, refinement of that plan. And then last year's uh, coronavirus uh, uh, um, limited uh, roads and trails report. So I'll be going over that. And then Mackenzie uh, Peters, who's been doing uh, the photography and video work on 90% of these uh, images, 100% of the final edits and uh, closed captioning. Uh, she will uh, give a brief summary of each of the five uh, field trips uh, that we've been going on, virtual field trips that I encourage you to um, do in person one of these days, visit some of these sites that look interesting to you uh, on a personal trip. Uh, the third part uh, will be a video we made for the students last year before we knew uh, we were gonna be doing virtual uh, uh, field trips. It was a video of how to use a drone to monitor uh, rural uh, roads and trails, particularly following ice storms or snowstorms, uh, just for routine uh, monitoring uh, uh, with a drone. Uh, works perfectly well in places that are otherwise impassable, also good for streams. So we'll be showing that uh, video. Uh, part four will be um, David uh, Gould uh, uh, demonstrating how uh, to maintain roads and trails, and also uh, giving us some background and some on-site uh, insights into the Elkhorn uh, Ranch Trail uh, that can be, uh, that should be, uh, to my estimation, uh, refinished, uh, refurbished, made available to the public again. It's about three quarters of a mile. There's a pack trail in the 1880s, uh, CCCs in the 1930s, built it into a recreational trail. And now it would be a, a, a great uh, a student project. Uh, part five of this lab will uh, show how uh, landslides and logging activities uh, uh, on the Elliott produce uh, spawning gravel for, for trout and lamprey eels and uh, sea run uh, cutthroats and other fish that uh, need spawning gravel. Uh, uh, we'll be going with David and Jerry and visiting uh, Gould's Lake um, and uh, showing uh, the fishing history of, of the Elliott State Forest as it relates to uh, landslides and ephemeral lakes. And then the, uh, the final uh, uh, part will be with Jerry uh, Phillips and David Gould, the two foremost experts on the history of the Elliott uh, from the 1880s to now. And we will be revisiting Jerry Phillips Reserve uh, uh, so that'll be the, the final uh, segment of this workshop, and I hope you enjoy it, and please use the index to uh, go to the parts that you might want to repeat or, or uh, revisit. Here is the ORWW uh, homepage, and uh, student work uh, from Southwestern Oregon Community College, SWAC, uh, the past uh, three years, this is year number four, is on the Elliott State Forest Recreation site. And uh, if we go there, we can see we've got uh, options for visiting field trips and st previous student work. So the uh, 2018 SWAC uh, F-251 Forest Recreation uh, class um, conducted uh, six field trips. Each of the students wrote, wrote, wrote reports. Those reports have been turned into PDF files and to uh, uh, HTML uh, files, or they're online. Uh, they're there for review. This was the very first, um, the very first recreation plan ever written for the Elliott State Forest. Here we can see uh, Jerry Phillips and David Gould and uh, instructor Tasha Livingstone and two guest speakers, experts on local birds, uh, with students at uh, Huckleberry uh, Point on one of our field trips. 
Now the student work um, has been put out as a, a formal recreation plan. Uh, the students were given homework, guest speakers, um, quite a bit of work to do, and the results were very, uh, very interesting. The introduction uh, shows uh, students on the West Fork Millicoma uh, on the road to Elkhorn Ranch. Again, uh, Jerry and David and uh, Instructor Livingstone and uh, the students we worked with that wrote uh, uh, this first recreation plan. We have other uh, uh, roads and trails section, uh, local forest recreational opportunities, uh, including lands immediately adjacent to the Elliott, uh, camping sites, campgrounds, uh, Elliott forest history, uh, sightseeing and aesthetics, cultural resources, uh, visit the local fish hatchery, um, discuss fish habitat, recreational fishing access, uh, birds and birding, hunting and trapping, uh, ethnobotany, all of these things are listed. Uh, there are student uh, uh, pictures. These are all gathered in one spot uh, to show you uh, what the students were studying, uh, what they were recommending, and uh, the summaries of the different things they had uh, seen and the recommendations they made for improving recreational uses of the Elliott um, and maintaining uh, traditional practices such as uh, uh, huckleberry picking and uh, elk hunting. Uh, again, there's um, several maps uh, demonstrating what the students are talking about. Um, one uh, a map that uh, we've been uh, following has been the uh, recreation map in which uh, the different campgrounds and the boundaries, the recreational uh, area boundaries, which include all of the Elliott. The Elliott's in the green. Uh, the boundaries that the students selected are is the dark green uh, outline and includes access roads to and from the forest. After the uh, uh, students finished uh, the 2018 plan uh, for uh, 2019 students, uh, we did peer review uh, the students uh, read the plans, they corrected errors, uh, they added uh, information. And uh, so the uh, 2019 uh, draft plan was refinement and an improvement uh, of the 2018 plan. So this is the peer review and uh, refinement process. It covers essentially the same basic topics. Um, we have a different group of students. Uh, it's a smaller group, and uh, we've got uh, David and Jerry and, and uh, Tasha Livingstone and, and uh, the 2019 students here at the same location on the West Fork, uh, Elliott. So the uh, uh, roads and trails and sightseeing, uh, local forest recreational opportunities, uh, these are uh, pretty much the same, um, same field trips and same topics covered by the uh, 2018 students, but again, uh, reviewed, refined, corrected, and there's still more to do. Uh, historical resources, elk habitat, hatcheries, fish habitat, uh, wildlife recreation, hunting, trapping, bird watching. We had to combine some of the topics into, um, uh, um, here's one of our students, uh, a bear she shot on the Elliott a couple years ago, the picture by her father. Uh, but we've, we've got uh, situations where we're showing um, what had been done in the previous year, refining it, and then uh, some of the recommendations are interesting. We recommended that uh, the um, south, um, the Silver Creek uh, Heritage Reserve be renamed Jerry Phillips Reserve, and here he is in Salem, and that became an act of the Oregon legislature. So we were able to achieve that. Um, again, the, the figures, we have uh, student uh, uh, photographs. Uh, that was part of their assignments, is to take uh, 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 and make photographs of the different areas we visited. Uh, we had a, we had a, a photographer from uh, SWAC uh, take photos. Uh, here is a, 
Silver Creek Falls, which was one of the favorite uh, stopping points for the students on our final uh, field trip. Uh, and uh, we have the same basic situations we had before. One of the things that would be uh, good to know uh, for those that are interested is that the uh, animals, which were listed in uh, the first year of students' work, have been uh, refined, slightly updated, and are now all listed uh, on the 2019 version. Same with the uh, native and, and exotic uh, birds of the Elliot. Photographs taken by students, um, research done by students, and um, now we have a summary available for everybody. And then the field trips that we developed in 2018, we took the six field trips, refined them to uh, five field trips, and then uh, Kobe Etzweiler, one of the students, um, produced maps for each of the routes we took. So we have photos, routes, maps, um, and uh, 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 different field trips that we took for 2018. And again, those uh, are all online. They're all available as a uh, PDF file, as is the 2018 plan. So if you just want to print up a report, um, we have a PDF version, as we've been looking at the hypertext HTML versions. But um, you can also uh, print up the report, get a listing, uh, analysis of what's being uh, said. And uh, um, it doesn't have to be connected to the internet uh, uh, to do that. The uh, students in uh, 2020 uh, uh, took the recommendations of the 2018 and 2019 student uh, draft uh, uh, recommendations regarding the roads and trails of the Elliott State Forest. So we had a meeting in uh, early March and decided to have uh, the five field trips just as they were and the uh, three workshops and we would work on uh, an, ad an, an addendum to the uh, draft recreation plans uh, focused on the roads and trails or history and significance of the Elliott with the recommendations as to uh, what should be done uh, next. So if we go to um, uh, Elliott State Forest on the ORWW homepage um, and we go to um, if we go to the Elliott State Forest Recreation page so if we go to that page uh, we'll find out that uh, uh, the students uh, shortly after we made uh, plans to do the field trips and the workshops in early March uh, 2020 shortly after that everything was shut down because of the pandemic so uh, on short notice uh, and everything closed, uh, we were told to create virtual field trips and we'd have to have distance learning workshops in which everything would be done uh, online. So uh, the report that uh, came out of that, uh, the students did uh, pretty darn good based on circumstances. It was a, a, a difficult transition. None of us had ever done distance learning or virtual field trips before. Uh, we didn't have uh, much equipment to work with. There was a, a no budget, but the students put together a, a, a report of Indian trails uh, within the Elliott that are known and documented between 1826 and 1900, uh, pre-Elliott County roads, including the Umpqua Highway, which was originally a county road, and the road to uh, Loon Lake between 1900 and 1930. Then the Elliott was created in 1930, and shortly after that, uh, the CCCs uh, came in and uh, built a significant amount of roads, repaired the, uh, the lookout towers on uh, Dean's Mountain and uh, built one on Cougar Pass uh, and did a significant amount of work uh, that would rem remained in use until the uh, early 1960s. Then in 1962, the Columbus Day storm hit and uh, uh, 100 million feet of timber uh, blew down in the Elliott and that caused a significant number of new roads to be built over 50 years ago, uh, 1962. And so for the next seven or eight years, uh, those roads were constructed to salvage a downed and damaged and isolated uh, timber. Finally, uh, between 1970 and 2020, there's very few logging roads built, uh, but the uh, Cougar Pass uh, lookout was uh, still in use and uh, um, 
it was abandoned in, in 1985, and recommendations have been made to turn it into an education center that uh, 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 students can uh, learn about the history of the Elliott uh, and uh, Lookout Towers and forest history of Western Oregon from. So uh, that's just a proposal at this point. Uh, what we did was uh, the field trips we recorded, and, and Mackenzie will be uh, talking about this in a little bit, but uh, we took the six field trips from 2018 and uh, consolidated them into five field trips for 2019. And then uh, uh, Mackenzie uh, uh, videotaped them uh, with uh, 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 and, and did some final edits, and we put together uh, a series of virtual field trips accompanied by uh, uh, worksheets. So uh, the distance learning workshops um, were developed in order to coordinate with the uh, with the uh, uh, the videotapes. So there were reading assignments, work assignments, uh, all done in isolation. Uh, people had uh, various quality equipment to work with. Wi-Fi was a problem. Uh, but uh, we were able to uh, develop uh, the student report just shown. Uh, we have PDF versions and HTML versions. Um, and then the workshops, which we're not using uh, this year, but have some value. These are specific uh, workshops um, devoted to uh, the 2020 projects, specific to the roads and trails of the Elliott. So each of the workshops was also uh, uh, videotaped. Uh, rather than meeting in a group and having discussions, um, I basically gave a, uh, a lecture. We didn't have Zoom at that time. Um, we didn't know YouTube indexing existed. We didn't have time or uh, resources to complete them um, in any case. So each of the uh, lectures and uh, workshops was uh, videotaped uh, and we began uh, indexing them. Uh, workshop number one has been indexed, and there's a few parts in here that could be useful uh, for current information. There's good information in here, but an index will uh, let you know uh, where to go and what to avoid. So returning to our uh, main uh, a worksheet, uh, we can see that this process is focused on the uh, uh, the roads and trail history of the Elliott, which is significant. So the, the student projects that were outlined uh, are shown on this map, and this map is kind of the, uh, uh, the Rosetta Stone to all the work that the students uh, subsequently uh, did. The uh, Elkhorn Ranch and Dean's Mountain links are included on the videos that uh, uh, Mackenzie will be talking about. Our second uh, field trip, which was uh, 5th of May, 2020, uh, or workshop, distance learning workshop, uh, had to do uh, with the uh, uh, specific work assignments of the individual students within the recreation area. Workshop number two has uh, closed captions. So uh, uh, Mackenzie has been doing closed captions on several of the uh, the, the field trips and the workshops so that uh, when we're outside and the wind is a pro problem uh, that uh, or somebody is speaking softly or a distance from the camera, you can uh, uh, hear better with what's being said. And then the final workshop, um, it was very short. It was just a summary. The students had done their work. Uh, we talked about formatting and that and uh, uh, that completed uh, our efforts to um, work uh, with virtual field trips and distance learning videos, and uh, um, it was uh, somewhat successful. Now, the icon at the bottom of every page uh, goes to the ORWW homepage, and the uh, common reference section to all of the um, Elliott work uh, that the students have been using for their reports for the videos and so on uh, are easy to locate 
And uh, the one thing I want to point out, uh, and we've done it before, we've got hundreds of, of uh, different reports, news articles, scientific documents. Um, we're about two years behind loading them, but there's several dozen of the basic already online. On the right-hand column here, all these PDFs uh, files lead to printable documents uh, that you can use. So you've got uh, uh, videos, uh, workshops, uh, written materials, photographs, uh, hundreds and hundreds of photographs and maps, and uh, um, the ability to use the internet and YouTube to uh, develop reports or learn more about topics you may, might be interested in. Okay, that wraps up the, uh, the first part of today's lab. Now the second part will be uh, Mackenzie Peters. Uh, uh, met her before, she's a videographer for uh, Northwest Maps Company, and uh, she's been doing the video work, the photography, the final edits, and the uh, closed captioning on these videos. So uh, uh, she's the, in the next section going to uh, describe each of the five uh, field trips that the uh, students have been taking, uh, the virtual field trips we took uh, uh, last year. And uh, Kenzie, would you like to say a few words on uh, differences between the, the videos from last year's field trips and what we're doing uh, at this point this year? Sure. Last year we used an Android, this year we stepped it up and we're using an iPhone 11, but the main um, improvements we've made have been Zoom, and the addition of an index and also closed captioning. Here we are on field trip number one. This is um, to Elkhorn Ranch. It's gonna tell you about the history of the Elliott State Forest. And here's one of my favorite spots. This is uh, the Indian Trail Springs. It's um, on the old Indian trail in between Allegheny and Scottsburg. And now I'm gonna show you how to navigate to field trip one. Here's how you get to field trip number one. You start at the ORWW homepage, then you head down to the ORWW media YouTube channel. You'll scroll down to the field trip number one, Elkhorn Ranch. Larson Slough, um, up the Trout Creek. You can see down here that it has been indexed. And here's this field trip's pictures and handouts and things. From last year. And you'll see that it's been indexed to help you find parts that more might be more interesting or that you might want to revisit, like Trout Creek. Always a pretty spot. And Indian Trail Springs, which you might recognize from my Zoom background. Here's the uh, spring along the Indian Trail. Yep. And next we'll visit Dean's Mountain. This is field trip number two to Dean's Mountain. And here we are on the Three Seas Road in between Cougar Lookout and Elk Peak. And um, you can see Loon Lake off in the distance really pretty spot here and now I'm going to show you how to navigate to field trip number two. Here's how you get to field trip number two. You start with the ORWW homepage and you scroll down to the ORWW media homepage YouTube channel. Then you'll scroll down again to find the playlist for the virtual field trips and you'll click on field trip number two Dean's Mountain.
This one has also been indexed and has pictures from this field trip on it. And it's also been indexed. Nancy Stewart here. Uh, Nancy, uh, this is the old Walker Ranch. Can you tell us anything about uh, 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 how many people lived here and, and what years that the ranch was here? Well, it was called Camp. It's also been closed captioned for wind. So if you can't All understand something, here's fact, closed captioning. In the state of Oregon. I was fortunate enough to talk to a fella that lived in town who used to live and work here in Camp Walker. And he said Another stop is Dean's Mountain Lookout. Yes. We just came up from the Walker Ranch on this 5,000 and turned on to the 2,000 and we're right. This field trip, we were able to take the Three Seas Road to all four of the lookouts in the Elliott State Forest. Dean's Mountain, Cougar Pass, Elk Peak, and the Trail Butte Lookout. So that was a pretty fun challenge, four peaks in one day. Here's field trip number three to Loon Lake. We're going to be traveling along the Umpqua River and going down to Loon Lake. And here, you can, in my background, is the Hinsdale Rhododendron Gardens and the view of the Umpqua right there. Photo by me. And now I'll show you how to navigate to field trip number three. We're going to field trip number three in the playlist. Loon Lake. Go down to the um, index. Again, here is pictures from this field trip and some other info, some PDFs and things. And here's the index. Brandy bar. This place was actually closed, but we still got some pretty good footage there. Virus uh, regulations, all the parks are closed. Uh, this is... Uh... Hinsdale Gardens is one of my personal favorite spots. We went there in full bloom. It was a perfect opportunity to take pictures of all the different types of flowers and scenery there is there. In addition to the rhododendrons here, there is also an oh, old growth that. tree, the Cougar Pass old growth tree. Okay, I'm standing next to one of the very few remaining old growths uh, on the uh, Elliott State Forest. It probably dates back to the 1770 fire. That and it, also uh, Loon Lake feet. Lodge. These are the uh, cabins and a few yurts from uh, Loon Lake Lodge, and normally they'd be occupied at this time of year. You'd hear a lot of kids yelling. Uh, there'd be uh, traffic here, and it's all vacant and empty. It's uh, shut down, and it's uh, late April. Everything's in bloom, um, and everything is shut down. Field trip number four starts at 10 Mile Lakes, and uh, we end up here at Jerry Phillips Reserve, another one of my favorite views on the Elliott. And now I'll show you how to navigate to field trip number four. And we're going to scroll down to the virtual field trips and find field trip number four, 10 Mile Lakes. And the index here, you can see there's a link here with more information and some pictures for the field trip. And this field trip starts um, at the old 
Elkside Lumber Company site that has now been turned into a park with palm trees and sand. Uh, Jerry, can you tell us about uh, Elkside uh, Lumber Company and what you see today compared to what used to be here? All right. Uh, well, nothing you see today resembles how it looked historically. Um, my memories here begin in 1952 when, uh, when I moved here to go to work for state forestry. Um, we also visited some spots on the Elliot, such as Bert Gould's cabin site. 90 miles an hour. Okay. We're, we're at the, the site of Bert's cabin and, and uh, David and Jerry, can you explain the uh, uh, Elkhorn Ridge when that was put in? And Clarence and, Gould uh, cabin site? I think they did. Uh, and Gould's Lake. And finally, ending at Jerry's Reserve, one of my favorite places on the Elliott. Here we are on the fifth and final field trip to Golden and Silver Falls. We meet with some locals to tell us a little bit about the area and the people that used to live here. And here is a view from the top of Golden Falls. There's a really cool hike along the old county road to get here. And now I will show you how to navigate to field trip number five. I'm gonna scroll down to the virtual field trips playlist and find field trip number five, Golden and Silver Falls. This field trip was rainy and we follow the East Millicoma the, uh, steamboat to Golden and Silver Falls. And we meet up with Roger Ott. All right. You, you want to tell the story on this, Roger? Yeah. They... Whose family owned and operated steamboats. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the history of them and show some pictures. Wow. So that was a major form of transport it was the one they built for the uh, for hauling the passengers up over the golden and silver falls from rogers place we continue up the east fork to meet with lionel yost who tells us about the early history of logging uh, uh, lionel we're here at the, the Merwood grove and would you like to uh, uh, tell us how this got preserved and and what condition it was in when they did it well it, it goes back to the those are big logs, too. Yeah. And also the homesteader that was here before then. Yeah. Okay. Well, W.W.R. Uh, Gwen, for whom uh, Gwen Crick is named, was a old state of Mainer. Uh, 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 he was a... He... Uh. <laughs> Lionel, uh, After that, we head to Golden up, and Silver up, up, up Falls, falls where Lionel and Roger tell us about the a little bit about the history there and the families that lived there. The property right here, which uh, was the homestead of George Schaefer's when, when the Schaefer brothers uh, homesteaded uh, the, the Supper Glen Creek. <clears throat> and uh, in 1911, George uh, sold that to the... And then we continue on and this see some other really cool spots here. Uh, old Growth is one of my favorites. This is a really great trail that you take all the way to uh, the Silver Falls.
Here's a sequence of photos showing how big the waterfall is. The human scale. Golden Falls, Glencrest uh, comes over Rock Precipice right here, and the Old County Road goes to the top. An ending with Golden Falls. That's the end of field trip number five. Uh, here is uh, part four uh, of uh, today's lab. It is the video we made for the 2019 students before we knew uh, we were going to have to take virtual tours. This was intended to be uh, instructional. It's 14 or 15 minutes, how to use a drone uh, to uh, monitor and uh, document rural roads and trails, uh, maybe after ice storms or snowstorms uh, for purposes of maintenance uh, and, and so on. Um, the videotape was done by uh, Frank Mahoney, who also did the final uh, edits. This is um, uh, Dr. Bob Zyback, Oregon Websites and Watersheds Project, Inc. My first selfie, I'm here with uh, Frank Mahoney from Portland, a videographer for, with nearly 40 years experience working with uh, community television. And we're at Blue Mountain Park demonstrating how a video drone can be used to uh, monitor and document roads, trails, and streams in forest settings. Here's a, a, a quadcopter, you call it, or a drone um, that can take video, mm -hmm. and the cost is around, for this model, around $500. It's about $500 with the combo of the radio controller, this controller uh -huh. is extra, it's about 100 and some odd dollars, okay. and uh, probably with a couple of batteries, yeah. I got about 500 bucks into it. Batteries, controller, quadcopter, are all about five hundred dollars, right? Okay, and then the phone, of course, is actually it's separate, and it's required to monitor or right. maneuver. Exactly. Yeah. Goes up. Okay. Goes down. Yeah. And then this will. They they call this yaw. I think. I'm doing a three sixty right now. Okay. For, with the same button. Yeah, the same button. Okay, so it's like pressure activated. Yes. Okay, and then what's the button on the right? Okay. This is actually, I won't go into the technical terms, this is forward, Good. Okay. backwards, and side to side, side this way, mm -hmm. 
and then slide that way. Okay, and then what are the, the red button, black button? Well, this is for turning my camera on and off. Okay. Or recording. Yep. Uh, other buttons here, we, we won't get into that, but I do have a tilt control. Yep. I'm tilting all the way down. Uh -huh. Now, you can see this, this kind of has a dramatic effect on the, on the video. Okay. I have to, I have to come down because. So the screen you're using, that's just a uh, iPhone? No, yeah. Or an Android? Android. I have to come down, I'm low battery warning. Okay. One good thing about a drone is that you can get up above the tree canopy and look at the surrounding landscape. This landmark here is Blue Mountain. And now we will slowly rotate around and see if there's any smokes or dead trees, chloratic trees, and we are back to Blue Mountain. So let's take it down. This gives a nice sound effect for me. Good. This uh, pile of firewood is salvaged from snow damage uh, in late February. The park was closed for several months and people were without power and electricity due to snows in late February and heavy uh, flooding in early April. It's just now reopened. Can you get out there and look? down both ways and then just come back yeah okay. well, this is what I'm looking at can't see as we leave the park we're approaching Mosby Creek Road the old Blue Mountain School which is now at Provecho Research Center Here we see Frank using the drone to inventory Mosby Creek. Mosby Creek is a, a tributary of the Rau River, Willamette River, Columbia River, and the Pacific Ocean. As we approach the stream, we can see there's some obstacles, and Frank is using line of sight to maneuver through the obstacles so that we can see the river. Can you look upstream and downstream? Yeah. And, and tilt it up to yeah. get the horizon yeah. in there? Wow. You can wave it yourself? Yeah. Okay, you saw it, okay. Can you bring it back this way? I am, but I oh, there we go. I don't want to get... See, we got GPS. Landing.
There you are. Here we're using a 360 in the drone to survey for uh, salvage damage from the snows and floods through the general area. We can adjust the elevations and angles to do a search such as this. Once we spot damage or salvage, we can drop the drone into a low elevation and get an exacting location and documentation of what we're looking at. If, see, if you want to take a look at the screen and stand, and you can just see the screen, what I'm doing. Now it's going to stop here. Yeah. It won't go any further than that. But. No, I just if something happens. See, it sees this tree, it's two feet away. Here we see root wads from overthrown trees that haven't been salvaged yet. The snow and the heavy rains and the flood okay. have uh, uprooted these trees. Watch the screen here. And we can see trees along the creek with the same problem. Want me to land it? Sure. How about on the landing it on the table? Uh, uh. Take off. You can see the screen, whatever I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not going to go any further than here because... Here Frank is trying to maneuver through a brush area on the trail and we can see forward obstacle avoidance uh, in play. It's a technical hold. term that yeah. keeps the like drone from running into brush. Either. Okay, it won't let me go through here because of its... Or running into uh, uh, objects. So oh. by using line of sight, Frank can uh, reorient himself. In an open canopy, line of sight maneuvering is very easy. If we have GPS, we can exactly replicate the sight later on following a snow or windstorm. This is a perfect tool for high school students, college students, and others helping with research or management of a forested area. So one of the real problems we've discovered is uh, shooting in the uh, forest. Wood, you lose GPS, and so that uh, increases the chance of error. Yeah, and, and I'm... And limits the value or, or limits the ability to, to uh, document things. Yeah, and I'm doing it all by uh, line of sight and this. This is... I'm, I'm going to your car. See, this is what you want to do, is you want to watch what I'm doing here. Yep, looks like I got a pretty good shot on it now. There we go. That's okay. showing what's on the screen. Okay, now I'm in the parking lot. I yep. turn around. This is a little bit too close to your... Is this, is this the entrance here? I'm not sure. It looks like it. Yep. There's the structure there right at the right-hand side. Now you're coming.
Hello, uh, this is Dr. Bob Zyback. Uh, this video was taken on February 4th, 2021 on two entryways to the Elliott State Forest uh, with David Gould. These entries go through private property that connect county roads with the, uh, the Elliott. And uh, David has been personally maintaining these roads for five or 10 years. Uh, he is going to demonstrate uh, how to maintain potholes, um, log cribs, the dangers of the roads, landslides, and so on. That's How long have you been uh, filling in these potholes? Well, I've been pretty much three weeks pretty straight. For how long? Pretty much for three weeks pretty straight. Two or three trips a day. Okay, two or three uh, trips a day for three weeks. How many years? Huh? How many years have you been filling in these holes? Well, I've been doing it all my life. Okay. This is a hole. Yeah. If you don't do that, that's all it takes. I'll fill that up and it won't, it won't become mess. Uh huh. So that's what I do. I try to catch them. Some of my are smaller, so I think. Uh huh. So it's not so much, don't take so much of rock. Yeah. And whatever. So, so a little spot like that will um, become a larger spot like that. How long does that take about? Depends on the traffic, I know. Depends on the uh, rain. The rain's the key. Oh. You gotta have water in, water in the road. Yeah. So here's the water. Every time you drive through it, it splashes. Yeah. Yeah. So that splashes. The fine stuff comes out. Yeah. And then even these rocks do. Uh huh. Yeah, I got a Dave, are we still on the county road here? Yeah, we're on the county road. Okay. When did this uh, wash out?
it, Dave. Yeah. Uh, we're, start, we're coming off the county road onto the. That's what I wanted. The, the LA State Forest Road. It's a 3000. It, it, now, it, is that. This is the 3000. That's zero on the 3000. Sometimes they call it the Dean Mountain Road. So, what, what we're talking about here is this is the right of way. This is the right of way. To they private had, land. They, they had to buy it. It has to be maintained by the user. User fees. They're not using it, but they're going to have recreation come up here so that they have to pay. The recreate, they're going to have to maintain it for that or nothing else. What I want to show here, because they're not maintained as the grader, the water sits on the road. And why it's sitting on the road, if you look over on the side here, we've got a berm. That's holding the water on the road. What, what's, what's holding it? This berm. See it here? That's a berm. Okay, Hold so it's, high, it's higher than the road surface. Yeah, and here, same thing over here. You can see where the rocks get fit. This rock, the grader should put it on the road. Uh -huh. And this stuff out here, all this... All this compost and leaves and everything. Yeah. The right way to do it would be bring a sweeper up here and actually sweep this stuff off the road. I see. But they don't do that. They try to, you know, they blade it either down and, and off and then try to get the gravel on. Uh huh. And this this here is what's holding the water on the road. When you hold the water on the road, the holes come back. So, so the, the holes are caused by water on the road? By the water on the road, because they don't have a crown. See, the crown's been lost because they haven't graded it back. If you look right up ahead of us here, you can see that. It's uh -huh. berm on the outside. Yep. Now, the water's running all the way from around the corner. Yep. Actually, it's running for almost a half a mile, uh -huh. over a quarter of a mile, yep. down the road, puddling in here, and then here's where the holes are. Wow. Mm -hmm. we're, we're stopped here by where the redwoods are on Larson and on the 2000 road. Just, it's on the part that belongs to Jerry Grossman and the state has a right of way here. They, they do not maintain this because they don't, uh, they're not, uh, not hauling logs out here so they don't have funds for it. But the problem is these blackberries like we have here on the side, they just keep growing and they grow right out here in the road. This, these have actually been cut back this summer. The guy lives up here, cuts them by hand. But you get most of this up here like this, it just comes right out in the road and then people can't see when you come around the corner.
We're starting up at 5,000 and I want to show them. They need to cut the berm on the outside, just blade it over both ways and then pull the rock on the road and you get a crown. Now you can see the road is completely destroyed. You can look at the camera and watch it. It's just all rutted up and all the water runs right down the road and takes the gravel down to the, on the county road or over the bank. And all they got to do is take the blade or get blade both sides away and then pull the rest the end of the road. Everybody wants to grade this road here. Here I can I put rock on it right here. Now we're going downhill and we go for over half a mile here and the water don't get off the road again. Uh -huh. This is against the, all, the, all the environmental rules and everything else. Uh -huh. and you can see that it just runs right down the ruts. Uh -huh. And it can't get away because of the, the vegetation on the outside and then it's built up a, two ruts where the traffic goes. So, so the vegetation holds the runoff, and that creates the berm, yeah, and, and then that forces the water into the, the water into stays, the road. The water stays in the roots. Okay. This here, a, a grader could berm all this off the sides, and then pull the rock into the middle and, and crown it, and the water would run off the road both ways. Uh -huh. But here it's running down the road all the way to the bottom of the hill. It's about a half a mile. Uh -huh. Right here somewhere is a half mile marker. Uh, from the county road. It's right here on the tree, right here. Yep, we right there. Yep. And I filled two holes right in, right ahead of us here. You can't, uh, <clears throat> right here. Three, actually three holes. You can see right there. Right, one, two, three. Yeah. And uh, that one's got water showing right here. I got to get more rock on that. Uh huh. But it'd be very easy to to uh, even make a ditch a ditch out on it. Uh -huh run the water off the road, but it's running right down this road, clear to the bottom. And when it gets to the bottom, you get a lot of fines, and then the water sits there, and then it just makes tank traps, holes, big holes. Uh -huh. You can put a, you can, I can dump a, a whole yard of gravel in some of these holes up here to fill. Right in the middle of the road. Oops. Here's where I dumped here. There's some brush that people put out there. That's that down from Lakeside. But here's here's where I dumped one of my loads, and you can see where I yep. I filled the holes. Yep. And then that's the little extra. Right, this, this is what this is one of our routes for the recreation classes. Right. This is the main. This is one of the main roads into the forest for the right out of Lakeside. It's right off 101. Yep. It's one of the most direct, direct routes, and the road would be. It's a beautiful road if they just maintain it. It doesn't take that much money to maintain this way. Here, here's another hill here where the, the water comes down. You can just see how rough it is. Uh -huh. it just loose, it's just completely loose. Because the water don't run off the road, it comes down the hill. Uh -huh. Good shot of where, you, where the crap is on the side of the road that needs to come off so the water will run off here. It, don't, it almost has a crown here yet, but it don't. Uh -huh. I want to stop here and get out, and we'll talk about this here. This is a this was another project that they did under contract. And they took the log crib and crib. There was a log crib yep. here that, yep. because of, the saddle was too narrow and they couldn't, they wanted to keep the road higher. Yeah. So they put a log crib in. They brought it out so they came back and put these logs or the rock in there. We'll get out and show it to you. Okay. The road was too narrow and they wanted to keep it higher here. Yeah. So it wouldn't be so steep. So they put a log crib in here, but the logs were. Uh, and filled in between them, but the logs rotted out, so they came back here a couple of years ago, uh -huh. took them out and put concrete blocks in on both sides, filled it back in, and they rocked it. Well, nobody's maintained it since then, except me. And, uh, what you have here is the water comes down the road. Is, is that the old rock log uh, crib there? That That's one of the log pieces of it. Okay. But the water comes down the road here for a quarter of a mile. Yeah. Runs down here, and it sits here. Yeah. The reason why it sits here is because you got this berm crap that gets out here. Uh huh. So it sits on the road, and then yeah. it's like here, and then and then you get water, and then it'll make holes. Well, I've been I filled this up. I put probably 
eight yards of rock in here. So this is all your rock yeah, right I through the middle there. Four inch rock on here. Uh huh. I've come back twice and done that. Yeah. I believe I have enough now, but it's got a. The bad thing about it is when the water comes down there and it runs over the edge. Yeah. What it's going to do? It could soften that, and then you could lose half half of this road. Uh huh. That's what I'm worried about. They need to D have it wash out. They need to have it some kind of a mechanism. Yeah. Up there to, to wipe the, the water off the road like a berm or a. Ah. Water bar system or something. Yeah. So the volume of water don't come down here. So uh, so a water bar would be up maybe around that corner there where yeah, we're looking. Yeah, just about, about, about where you can see there, and then that yep. would put the water off both sides before you get to where this narrow spot is. You don't want to lose this narrow spot. Is there a way to put a water bar in there so uh, so? Yeah, well, you, you can actually do it with the. By, I mean, where you can drive over it very comfortably. Yeah, with the, I wouldn't even. Have, all you could have to do is you can take an angle, angle it off on an angle. Yeah. And, uh, and make it lower so the water run off and don't run down the road. It's very simple to do with a grader. Uh, but, but a lot of times those water bars are tough for a car to drive yeah, through. Yeah, but they don't have to do it like a water bar. They can do a running water bar. In other words, they make it longer uh -huh. and, and not quite as steep. But it's got to start with it. So it'll pick the water in the middle of the road and run it to the low spot off the, off the road. You can do that with a grader blade. Uh-huh. Oh, so, so it'd be a pretty minor operation. You don't have to make a water bar, you just make it slope off. Okay. Just about got it okay. Okay. Really what this needs is the grater to come down and shape it. Uh-huh. And to get the crown in it and then get the water off. Uh-huh. And even this little hill going back this way, they can do that. Actually, what the, all they got to do is come here with the grater. Yeah. And put their put their hook his leg down on an angle. Yeah. Put it down lower. Yeah. Higher here, and he he actually berm it off like that. Yeah. So this is higher here. Yeah. And it's lower over here, so the water will run off. Mark Mark can do that pretty easy, couldn't he? He can do. He does that really good when they let him. Ah. So David, what, what you're saying is little slides like this will fill up the, the ditch and then the water comes out in the road and then it runs downhill to like we just saw at the, the log crib there. If you're looking on the side of you, you look at the grass and, and that's, a, that's a berm out there. Uh huh. With all the leaves in the grass. So the water runs out in the road and then the leaves and the grass get set to the side and they create a little two, three, four inch berm and that keeps the water in here. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Is there a chance the road itself could go out here because of that? Well, it, that's what happened. Took the outside edge of the road off. When you come down there, I'll show you right where the water went. Okay. I probably put 40 yards of rock in this 150 foot section here. How, how many yards? Probably 140 yards, maybe. Uh, over how, how much time? So this slide here was pretty much caused by uh, water running off the road. See where the water runs here? Uh -huh. Just a second. Let me let me get you in there. So we got okay. The water's running right down the road. Yeah. You can see where it runs here. There's the yep. tracks. Yeah. Right past Bob, and you go right on down, and it goes right over the bank. I'll get my feet in there for size. Go and right over. Okay, it's starting to go uphill here, so it yep. runs off the road right there. Uh -huh. And that's what took this edge of the road off, is that water. Wow. You get out here, and you can take a better picture of it. There it is. But don't get too close to that bank. It's yeah, well, undercut. There's your, and then you 
See where the water's going down there making roots in that now. You gotta get this water off of here. Uh-huh. You stand back here, you can look down there for 400 feet and this spike still can't just kept going. Yep. How, how often should they be grading this? Well, they ought to grade it. Every year? Probably at least twice a year. Twice a year, okay. And they haven't done it for 10 years? Probably not. Okay. And then we get landslides like that. So there's the berm, there's the water running into the road like we've been seeing. Comes down here over the edge, and here's where the people got on the berm, screwing around, and they went off the road here, and they limited it, and they, they broke the top of that tree off, but they're over here, and they had to get somebody to pull them out. Oh, so somebody uh, the vehicle, wrecked here. The vehicle was tore off the road here because of this slick berm. Uh -huh. They got off here. So it's it's a hazard. It's, it's a hazard, yeah, it's a death trap. Wow. These berms out here, they're slick, and they get on, uh, and they take you in. Uh-huh. Well, they used to be liable for this. Somebody was killed there. What I'm saying, somebody needs to come up here and take care of this. I'm 78 years old. I'm getting hard to get around. I even fell down the road here a little bit ago. So somebody's got to start taking care of this stuff. I'm going to do the best I can as long as I can. But... Because I gotta knock that down a little bit when I come back. Uh-huh. You've done this before. <laughs> Well, I'm lazy, lazy that one. See, I can actually run the water off the road with this gravel. Uh huh. But it, now, if it runs off the road, though, isn't there the problem again of of uh, landslide? Well, we're pretty close here. All right. Uh huh. But it's a lot better than it is down there. Uh huh. What you have to do to get it to go off is do this. Get rid of this. All this is that gum that's on the edge of the road. Yeah. Can they do that with equipment pretty easy? Well, the grinder do it real well. Yeah. That'll pretty much get it started right there. Uh huh. So just that little trench you dug in there will will redirect the water. Yeah. Oh, cool. Don't take much. Uh huh. I'm standing in where the trail to Elkhorn went, and it's uh, it's on the ridge on the twenty or on the thirty two hundred road. We're in here about a half a mile off of the. 2000. And when I came in here with my grandfather, there was, all there was was a trail. There wasn't any roads there. It was in, uh, we drove up from Ridgeport up the CCC road up Schofield Creek under Dane Mountain and came out to, was the days 2000. And the end of the road was here about a mile from here. Well, uh, we had to stop and walk and we walked out to about here and sat down to rest. My grandfather, he was about 70 at the time. and This, this would have been 1948, I believe, 49. And I was going to school and uh, we were going down to Elkhorn to camp out for a weekend. And the, 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 the Elliot hadn't even, forest hadn't even started yet. It didn't start until 18, 1954. So I was in there in 18, or 1948 sitting there and my grandfather said this is your forest I said what are you talking about grandpa and he said well the state rearranged all this so this belongs to the it's a common school fund it belongs to the school children here all the school children in Oregon it's their forest and I said wow that sure sounds like a big deal and the trails also came up from uh, Stoll's Falls up, up the river and we'll be on part of that later today they went to Elkhorn Ranch too and these could, the trails could all be refurbished for people to use for recreation.
for you. This has been a working forest for the last 60 years. Yep. A working forest. Now today, people don't know that, that term anymore. A working forest is being managed daily to the benefit of the owners. That, as Dave says, that's Oregon school children. Yep. All the way I wanted to, to kind of go out and kind of give them an idea of what we're... Okay. If I can make it. Right, well, be more careful. Yep. Falling twice and be more careful. Right here. The trail, I opened the trail up at the excavator, but the trail come down here and turned because the ridge drops off steep. So it didn't go down to pop the ridge, it turned, went back under where the car is for probably 300 yards, and then they turned again and came down and hit the top of the ridge below us. So there's a switch back down. There's a switch there. back in. There's a switch and then from there on, it pretty well follows the trail. Once you get down, Further down, you can get in the brush and work around. You can find the trail. The best way would be to come up from the bottom, and you could follow the trail because you're coming up under the brush, and you could cut your way, cut your way as you come up. You're going down, you're just kind of working backwards. So you think we're, we're, is... we're going to go down at the bottom, and I'll show you where to go in at the bottom. Okay. It's about a three quarters of a mile, Jerry. Something like that. Three quarters of a mile. Make a good hike for people if they want to hike. That's right. I'm just uh, mainly want to show them where the trail is, so maybe somebody will want to fix it. All there right. I wanted to show we're at the Elkhorn Ranch right now, where the first crossing is. Bob's down here where the cars cross sometimes, and this is where the head of the waterfalls on the on the old ranch. And this is one of the fields here, and the trail come to Elkhorn came off the hill to my right here, and uh, you kind of see it over here. But you follow that road up. It goes right up this draw for about 400 yards and turns turns left and then that's all been opened up and then you come to a big hemlock tree in the middle of the trail or the road and that's where I stopped. That's where you can find a trail, just follow it and go all, it goes up on the ridge and about uh, three quarters of a mile up to where we came from up on top. It's a good, good, it's a, it's a good trail. It's a good trail. It's, it was a good trail. It was, it was about four foot wide and just it's brushed in, I'd have to brush it out in a few places, I'd have to dig a little bit. The pack trail. Yeah, pack trail. We stopped here with the fish people and it's called the Trout Creek and if you look at it, you can see the spawning gravel that came in here about three years ago after we had a storm. Further up a uh, slide came off of one of the old clear cuts and there it's kind of an unstable area and it stopped here and this is how you get your spawning gravel and it continues on out into the river of course and then uh, if that's the main, I want to talk about that and then I want to show you the, the uh, spawning gravel that, that we're looking at right here came from a landslide about three years ago and it's working its way down the river now. That's where the, the spawning gravel comes from, the landslides. And Gary, the fish guys actually found some small fish in there too. So. Gary Vondro, yep. Yeah. Okay. Ready. 
Uh, we're looking at a waterfall uh, coming into Trout Creek, bringing in spawning gravel. What I wanted to show here, Bob, is last year we stopped there and there was a gravel bar in there. And I showed where the fish had spawned. You can see the uh, red or whatever they call it. Well, the gravel bar is gone. There's a little bit of gravel, not very much. There's more down there on the corner. You can see it down there. And this gravel has come out of the, it's taken about four or five years. It's came off of the a double meander timber sale up here. They had a slide come out of there, went into the river and had a, a big uh, jam. There was quite a, quite a lot of, uh, you know, backed up quite a bit of water there for a while and I finally got it out. But that material has worked its way down and it's still working its way down. So the spawning gravel comes out of the side draws and is moving down the river. I just wanted to show that. because This was all gravel here. Uh, it's clear up as high as the water for a while right here. Last year it's gone. And that's from the be Meander uh, timber sale? Yeah, it landslide. Came out, came out of that landslide. Uh -huh. If you look right here on the ground, but you see all this trash? The water's come up into the road here. You, know, you can see, see the sand on it too. So the water, you know, when you get a freshet, the water comes up this high. You can see this drift, and further down there's logs and stuff that got on the road. And what happens, the water comes down the river. And there's a, there's a concrete, there's a, you see the high the bedrock here. The water's coming down the river and it's working its way on the outs towards us on this side. It raises up higher here and that's why it gets on the road. Over on the other side, it may be down two feet lower than this. It's just the centrifugal force. And all the debris ends up in the road right here. But that's something they ought to be talking about on some of these, uh, classes at Oregon State they might have. I'm ready. Right, I want to talk about the drift that comes down the river in the winter time. And you can see where it's piled up there, and it's caught against those logs that uprights that fell off the bank up there. And that's part of the Elkhorn Ranch timber sale, the stream buffer that they left. And those trees that fell over on the tops got in the river, and that's created a blockage in the drift coming down to stop there. People don't understand how much drift comes down when you got a storm sometimes. We're going to show you another pile further down also. All right. We stopped at below the water hole where they're trying to make a recreation park here. It's a really be a good place for a recreation park. But if you look in the river here, you can see the bedding in the sandstone. It's on an angle. And uh, what's happened here is kind of an unconformity or something. It's, most of the sandstone in this forest is laying flat there on an angle. But what happened, the river came down, this was higher, and it went underneath what behind us, around and it came around us. And then this whole bank behind us had a slide that slid in here, and a lot of big boulders. You can see boulders and rocks around in different places, but then what I want to talk about is the debris, and you can see all the woody debris that's washed down in the, in the wintertime. And uh, big piles of it here. People just don't understand how much stuff comes down these rivers in the winter time when they with these buffers that are dying, the alders are dying and then they fall down in the rivers. What we're doing we're taking a picture of where Gould's Lake was and the big logs laying on the bottom are some of the old old growth logs that were standing trees here from the first original burn in 1879 or the last one. 
but it fell into the lake and the lake was formed in 1894 and the logs have drifted down with and the slide that formed the lake is just just a little ways below here and we'll stop and take a picture of where the slide was next those logs are probably 20 feet lower than the water level was at one time What you're looking at is the bottom of Gould's Lake. It's uh, silted in. There's probably eight foot of sand there. And now the stream is cutting through it since the slide that formed the lake has been washed away. And there was, uh, you look up the hillside, there's alder and big fir. Well, they were above the level of the water at one time. There's probably 24 foot of water above the bottom there. 24 feet deep at least. Yep. Anyway, we're standing where the slide come down in 1894, and the part of the slide is right here on our left. Came up this high on this side, and uh, this is all washed out between here and there. And uh, so the lake lake was up is about 10, about 20, about 15 feet lower than we are here. And this, if you look down a little better, you can see the the rocks and everything. Well, all this is washed out. And the gravel, and it took the gravel down, on further down. Can you look, see this down here? You can see this is a huge slide in here. Came off the hill on the far side here. And all this stuff is washed out and it's created spawning gravel in Elk Creek below here. And we're going to stop down and show you some of the spawning gravel. And, uh, some of those old logs laying in there are from the original trees that were grown here that were snags when my grandparents were here. Well, these alders are here are over 100 years old. Some of these big alders. And if you look up there on the side hill, it's just alder, and then the fur beyond is at the, on top of where the slide comes down. Where the slide was, and you, you can really see the spawning gravel that's the gravel that came out of all the material that was in the slide it was brought down here by the current and then they put some structures in here in recent years to try to and you can see that the rotten wood and stuff it catches in it and then it helps build up and it builds up makes ponds and, and the spawning gravel it really helps quite a bit gives the fish a better chance this whole bottom in here is just is probably 20 feet deep of material that came down from that slide and, and, and settled out here. That's why it's so wide in here, Mandier, meanders. My grandparents uh, came in here in 1885 and when they lived in here, they said this was the best fishing stream in the area. So it had gravel here before the slide came in also. They were living here in 1894 when the slide came down and they, the, 
mile from here over the hill when it, and they felt the earth shake and the house rattle and came in here next summer and found the slide in the lake. Thank you. Start. Yeah, I stepped on a couple of stubs. Maybe a, a um, if Kinsey could get you guys just kind of walking across over those trees there, that'd show how big they were and put you guys in here, getting back towards the car. Well, we can walk that way. We're going. All right. Jerry, you want to tell the tell the story about uh, how this came to be? All right, I'll I'll do that. <clears throat> But we're standing on the boundary, pretty much, on the old boundary between the Elliott State Forest and the Warehouse Tree Farm. Uh, that's how it was for uh, uh, a, a century. This was, uh, it was the original boundary. And um, in working on the, on the Elliott State Forest inventory and on working on the forest all the way, timber sale actually there, for 50 some years, um, I became aware that um, actually with very little timber on the Elliott Forest is older than uh, let's say, 120 years old. Very little bit older than 120, which is uh, beautiful timber, but it's not true old growth. And it occurred to me as a forester that uh, it'd be a good thing to have a, a reasonable amount of old timber, old growth timber in the state forest for people to enjoy looking at. Uh, the lifespan of Douglas fir is about 400 years. So I thought it'd be good to have some older timber in the, in the forest. <clears throat> well, on this part right here in this area, the, there, there is, some of that old timber, which you're looking at in this picture here, you're looking at some of this. Um, and I thought, well, it'd be a, one way to have this be here for a long time, would be for us to um, trade 40 acres of state timber some, somewhere else for 40 acres of, of warehouser timber right here. Uh, from about where, about where we're standing to the, to the south, over this way here. So what you're looking at here, and where the camera's pointing now, that, that, that was all warehouser timber that, that, for that 40 acres. So I proposed that to the warehouser company, that we trade 40 acres of our, of our timber elsewhere for their 40 acres here. Well, the company did not want to do that. Those, these logs over here, were, it was all intended for their mill in North Bend. Uh, but I talked to them for quite a long time and uh, finally persuaded them that it'd be good to have one area of old timber for the people to enjoy looking at. Uh, There's not, not the last is old, old timber left in this whole river, river drainage right here. So they finally agreed to do it. So that's exactly, that's why this is here now. We, we created 40 acres of, of, of Elliott State Forest timber elsewhere for this 40 acres of warehouser timber. <clears throat> so that's why this sign is here. It, it commemorates that, that legal transfer. So what's behind us to the north, that is original Elliott State Forest timber, this direction. So some of that old timber's over here. But then, where we just where, you, where the camera was pointing earlier, behind us here, this over there, that was warehouse regime. So this is a cooperative creation, and we're we're thankful that it worked out that way. Now, uh, while it's still warehouse owned, it was about 1965. <clears throat> it was a big, a big windstorm happened in '62. Big windstorm in '62. And it blew down quite a few trees 
on both both lunar ships. Right here, this is, was still where I was growing then. And uh, if you look around, you can see a few trees that were damaged when Weyerhaeuser came in to to salvage log trees that had fallen down in the windstorm. One of those is right behind me here. Uh, right here, this was damaged during that salvage logging when 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 logging tractors moved some of the trees that were blown down we moved those around to load onto log trucks. So that was, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't damage the tree any. Douglas fir has, is tough. <laughs> it can lose quite a bit of bark and it does not damage the tree any. Uh, so uh, it doesn't look good, that one's five damage. But, I, I, um, I'm gonna ask you something right here. Um, this, this is damaged and you say it, it hasn't damaged the tree any. No, it has not. There's no rot that's got in there. It, it's healing over, but how did it, is this from yarding logs? Around it? Log. it was a log, yeah. Right, they, so, so this is damage from Weyerhaeuser. Right, okay. exactly. It hit it with a log, it was one of those lo loading logs. Right. 1965. Uh -uh. So that's a scar from 55 years ago. Exactly. Uh huh. And it's still healing over. It doesn't hurt the tree anyhow. Wow. Well, you got you got uh, three inches of growth there from that scar right to the end of that. That's right. That's right. Because the tree's growing so slow. Now. That's these, right. I want to say that these trees are the same trees that were at Elkhorn, but at Elkhorn when my grandparents came in, they were snags because the fire killed them. Dead. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't want to believe that, but these trees were actually probably this, this tree's less than 300 years old. It's probably 250 Two, at the most. That's right, 250. And that, this, this is the timber that was in, where my grand, all the LA, actually all the LA fours that burnt in 1879 was the last fire. Seven, that's right. So, give you an idea how slow these trees grow once they get big. That's something we agree on, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> say, David, you want to say uh, real quickly the story about how Jerry Phillips Reserve got named? <laughs> I, 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 I didn't do it. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Phelps Reserve was a, uh, this saving trays for posterity was kind of a joke at, back in those days. And uh, uh, Blitz Weinhardt or Henry Reinhardt had a, uh, Henry Hein Reinhardt's Reserve, they called it. So some of the foresters down there at the Coos Forest Patrol called this Jerry Phelps Reserve. It was private reserve, wasn't it? You know, the Jerry Falls Private Reserve. <laughs> so I, I thought that was kind of cute. So they, that's, I helped get the, this established for Jerry Phelps Reserve here. Yeah. It started being kind of a joke, but it, it stuck. Yep. And, and now it's now it's a uh, real nice legacy. <laughs> now, now it's a, uh, a key point of the Elliott. I yeah. think people are really starting to appreciate it. I've known Jerry ever since 1954, yeah. uh, before they started harvesting in the Elliott Forest. <laughs> Old friends. Yeah. Oregon State grads. <laughs>